Hey folks, this is LJ, your opinionated host for the Opine Motel podcast. Hope you're well. Let's get into it. Hello, hello. Welcome back, everyone. Sorry, and forgive my absence. I've had a few things going on in the world. As you might imagine, there's a lot of chaos and, and change that's going on on this coronavirus. So there's been a slight delay in me sending out some podcasts. However, I'm back. And I'm going to break my own rules. I thought I was going to do the topic of passive aggressive today. However, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised because I've got a great guest for you today that I've bumped that topic and I'll do that further down the line, probably next week. So Tom Leibelt is our guest today. And Tom learned from a young age how to sell and negotiate businesses by getting haggled by Russian vendors. His family moved from Poland to the US to escape communism and his parents took any job that they could to survive. Seeing all this as a young man motivated him to never want a job and to keep moving forward as an entrepreneur, publisher, salesman, and one of the top Polish hip-hop artists. Tom spends most of his time in Chiang Mai these days in Thailand. He runs smart business marketing and we market online courses. He seems like one of those guys with the Midas touch where everything he works on turns to gold. He has published around 5,000 Kindle books, built a successful SEO and online course marketing business, partnered with Muay Thai Champion, and owned a coffee shop, a retail store, a record label, created a documentary, and released two albums with five hits on Top 10 Polish Radio. All of this was bootstrapped and done with zero outside funding. So let's together dive into the mind of a digital nomad. Without any more prevaricating, please welcome my special guest... Tom Leibelt. So welcome, Tom. Welcome to the Opine Motel. I'm really excited to have you here today and pick your mind on all the vast array of things that you've done in your life. And I mean, the first thing I really want to know is why Chiang Mai, Thailand? Why, what, uh, that, it seems like a beautiful part of the world and certainly a beautiful part to certainly hang out during the coronavirus. But why, why there, my friend? <laughs> hey, man, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a, definitely an interesting choice. Um, it is a nice spot. Um, this is one of the capitals, I guess, of digital nomads, right? So when I first started traveling the world, slow traveling, um, to kind of figure out whether my business can take it, I went to a conference in Berlin. And it was people doing, you know, a similar thing as me, which is just working online, um, growing businesses. And I found out that when I went to the conference in Berlin, um, I found out that there's a bigger conference that they're running in Bangkok, you know, and I've never been to Bangkok. So I thought, oh, okay, it's interesting. Um, And what happened is after that conference, people migrated again. They either went to Chiang Mai uh, or Vietnam and the bigger crowd went to Chiang Mai, so I kind of followed uh, with them. And, and this migration always happened around October. So October, we were in Bangkok, then November, December, January, the whole crowd, you know, 150, 200 people would be in Chiang Mai, plus a lot of other nomads that um, just come to this place. So is Chiang Mai the Silicon Valley of Thailand? Sort of. Um, so here's the problem, right? Like Silicon Valley is where you have people coming in, um, you know, to work for these big companies and startups. Chiang Mai, other than the crowd that I kind of came with, is mostly wannabe entrepreneurs, right? So people who, you know, seen someone, you know, working on their laptop by the beach and got kind of, you know, thrown in here. They're making $1,000 a month, hoping to survive. It's it's not a great situation for a lot of them. (laughs) Um, But the marketing was great. So a couple of the people um, who came here, you know, in that same kind of thinking, right? Not making any money or anything. Um, they were good at writing blog posts. And they made this place, you know, seem super exciting. Like, man, all you need to do is get a one-way ticket, come in, and you're going to just, you know, like blow up. Like, you're going to have so much money, so many connections. But you know the reality, right? Like, <laughs> when, you, yeah. you know, when you come into Absolutely. a place like this, like, I'll talk to him for a few minutes. I'm like, yeah this is not going to work. There's nothing for us to talk about. Like you're on a different level. And then they get thrown into the sharks, you know, which is the other people who are also trying to make a thousand (laughs) and they're all, you know, kind of trying to make it, make the money on each other. Right. So 
it's it's definitely you know it's a good place but it really depends which circle you end up okay yeah i mean that makes sense i heard that in one of your other podcasts that there's a big community there that comes what is it every september yeah. to december is, is that because of the weather or is it there's conferences what's happening in so chiang mai at that time um the winter season starts in October, September, October. So most people come a little before to get the nice apartment, right? Because if you come in October, you're going to be stuck <laughs> in an expensive Airbnb. So everyone comes around September and rents for like three to six months. In March, um, well, it's actually getting earlier and earlier. Have you seen like, I would say February, the smoky season starts, which, you know, they're burning uh, plantations and um rice fields so it's unbearable so everyone leaves so you have these couple months and what they did right. is the organizers of the conferences just all set up everything within those three four months so you'll have like the digital nomad conference we had a crypto conference there's an seo conference so you have about four or five thousand people that show up just for that wow okay that's that's interesting. That's that's a lot of people to to descend on on yeah, one place in Thailand. Every year. Um, and I'll be honest, I did, I didn't know about um, this being so. The, the, the it's mecca. sort of like Lisbon, in a way, right? Like Lisbon has the web summit. You know, when once a year, just an mm, insane yeah. amount of people. I think like twenty five, thirty thousand people come to Lisbon, right? So it's a similar right, yes. type of thing. It's like in the U.S. Um, for the listeners, it'd be more like uh, San Diego, right? When you have um, traffic and conversions and right before social media summit, they, they usually kind of overlap on two days. So you'll have like 10, 12,000 people running around with their laptops during that time. It's that same situation. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's certainly a nice location and I, I get it. There's, there's certain places in the world that certainly are desirable and certainly people gravitate to digital nomads are certainly have, have picked a, a beautiful spot for <laughs> for camping out and, and starting to be entrepreneurial. And I mean, it seems like your entrepreneurial journey started early. We didn't always say at age seven and nine, I saw you had an interesting past that I read from your bio, basically born in, in the 80s in communist run Poland. Just tell us a little bit more about you that. Know, when you're a kid, like you don't realize what's happening much, you know, because it was a bit different back then. Yeah. Like we, you know, were able to run outside for, you know, for hours, like no one really checked on us, no cell phone. So as a kid, like, you know, a lot of freedom, like we always had a lot of friends, like I always lived in the city. So like the neighborhood kids were around, we'd have like a group of 10, 15, you know, every single day we'd be hanging out. So, you know, overall it was fine. It's when you think about like things you can buy or eat or hanging out at the dentist. Like that's when things became much less fun, right? So like my dad would bring catalogs with toys from Germany. And, you know, I'd go to the Polish store, uh, the toy store, and they have like two stickers, you know? And I'm like, what is, what is going on here? Like, what are the toys? Like, we don't have any toys. And then, you know, later on, we realized it's like, who, who pays you to stay here? Like, it's an empty store. You know, same thing with, with food, you know? Like for a while, um, my parents had to get like cards from the government along with all the other citizens that told you what you can get from the store. Right. So you'd have like two um, boxes of like uh, bread or, you know, some sugar, like they would just, it was rations basically. Right. So you couldn't get anything. Meat was being yeah. exported to the West and then scraps uh, would be given in Poland. And my parents would have to like illegally get actual meat from, you know, the farms and stuff. And, you know, that was a the situation there. Like going to the dentist, like we, you know, it, it was such a poor experience. Like they wouldn't numb you for anything. Like I had, you know, cavities fixed and teeth being yanked out without any anesthesia. Imagine that, you know? So. Wow. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's some, that's some interesting, <laughs> interesting way to grow is, up. My but friend. That's the reality wow. of Poland and those countries back then, right? So overall, like, you know, socially, it was fine. You know, we had family, we had friends, like everything seemed okay on the surface. Yeah. But then, you know, like you, you see it in the people and like, you know, sometimes, you know, other Europeans, especially because Americans don't know much, but Europeans will be like, why are Polish people? So, you know, and they'll have like stereotypes. Well, you grew up that way. There are a lot of things that kind of you take with you for a long time, right? Like you're not the happiest person, you are don't put up with nonsense very easily. You're kind of blunt. Like there are things which just, you know, 
happen when you put that much stress and you know take the control out of people's hands well yeah i can certainly relate to the bluntness us uh, australians are usually <laughs> thought of as, as as pretty blunt ourselves but it, it's really interesting to hear that given growing up in such an environment that that spark of I mean, it even seemed like entrepreneurial things in which I think there was something that you mentioned about, you know, selling stuff to in football stadiums in, in the, yeah, in, in Poland at that time. So already you were starting to think about just different ways in which that you could survive and thrive, so, I guess. There were really two ways um, to make money in Poland back then. One, you had to be part of the Communist Party or endorsed by them. And then you would get things, you know, just as any bribing type of, you know, government does, right? Or yeah. you'd have to do it kind of on the black market, behind the scenes, right? And my dad hated communism. So everything he did was sort of around, which was very difficult, right? Because you're going against the system. But that's what he did. So he would smuggle alcohol into the West and then he would bring electronics back and we would sell them around the soccer stadiums and, you know, things like that. So from the beginning, you know, I kind of seen that and a lot of my family members were doing similar things. And it, it was just something that seemed normal, you know, like if you don't want to be, you know, with the communists and you just run your own business. Now, it wasn't the same as, you know, the stuff we're doing now, which is completely illegal and and, you know, like you, you, yeah. can, you can do it properly. This was very, you know, kind of hustle um, type of businesses. Yeah. Uh, so, the, so the OG of hus yeah, hustling. The OG, yeah, right. So it was like <laughs> very much like when I started, you know, selling weed when I was young in America. You know, it was a very like, just you know, but it was the same hustle mentality. I was like, oh, I got to make money. And I remember I was like 14, 15. And I went up to a lawyer and I'm like, hey, I want to open a business. He's like, you can't. You, you got to be 18 for that. I was like, what? I got to make yeah. money. So, you know, I got some weed from an older guy and I started selling it. I was like, here you go. I'm making money. And then to open my first store in America, I just um, found two guys who were older. They were like 18, I think, 18, 19. And I would put in my weed money and they, you know, they were able to draft the papers and we had a store open. But, you know, like everything like I did was always um, kind of, you know, around the edges, like kind of skimming around the edges in the beginning because that's what I was raised with. No, and that, that makes Perfect sense. Uh, so, I mean, right from the start, you already had that idea that I think that sometimes in the West, we, we go through that system in which the, you know, we go from school to whatever university and, and, and let's join the, the corporatocracy. Whereas your point of view was, well, actually, let's start making money ourselves. And that's, that's a very interesting and different mindset than, yeah, usually seen. So... When we got to the States, um, my parents uh, had to get, you know, three or four low wage jobs just to survive. Their credentials meant nothing. Like my mom was a teacher, a very skilled teacher in Poland, but, you know, they didn't care. You don't have the American University. It doesn't count for anything. My dad was actually um, a person that drives trains in Poland, which was a very high paid job in America. Again, doesn't matter, you know. Right. So super low skilled jobs. I mean, they, they worked from, I don't know, six, maybe till 11, 12 at night. So six in the morning till 12 at night just to survive with me. Like, so I never seen them except the weekends. Yeah. And the only thing I thought about jobs, like when people like would ask me, you know, oh, what kind of job you want? Especially the counselors in school, right? I'll be like, I don't know, none. They seem like garbage, right? <laughs> like my parents are working three of them and I can't even get new shoes, you know? So I'm like... Like the only thing I know, I'm not going to be you because I don't want to be asking kids these stupid questions. Um, but I don't. So I, yeah, I was very blunt from the beginning. But it was because of what I've seen, right? I'm like, this is nonsense. Like you got people working, you know, all day, you know, living the American dream, right? And we can't afford anything. I was like, come on. Yeah, and and it it does seem that it, we are certainly shuffled into certain lanes, and there are certain lanes that people say that we should stick to. But I, I think that the two things that certainly stand out to me is one, actually that bluntness works for you because of course, then at least you know truthfully what you think and other people know what you think. And then you can start building trust upon that. And the second point is that when you're 
when you've got those, when you're having a look at different options or, you know, looking uh, that horrible but too often used, you know, looking outside the box, that was your entire life. It was always outside the box compared to what the typical American family would be. So I guess the it, it's interesting to hear how some of those journeys that you took or some of the initial decisions made s- such an impact. Um, and also modeling and seeing how your parents worked. They were such hard workers, you know, three jobs. This is the typical migrant family experience. And and was there such a transition from jumping from you know, communist Poland over to the States, you know, when you were kind of 10 or 11? Was there a culture shock? So not really, a, not really a culture shock. So there's just one thing that happened. And I, I've thought this through, and this is why I've kind of, you know, uh, my confidence levels were through the roof for a long time. Like when we left Poland, I lost my friends, my family, and all yeah. my belongings, which then you turned me into a kid that's got nothing to lose. Right. Yeah. Right. Like other people often ask me around that time, even like, where's your confidence coming from? Because that was just like unrelentless. You know, like it was it was insane. Like the stuff I would like just go <laughs> after. And I'm like, dude, I got nothing to lose. Like we have nothing here. I've lost everything. Like it's, it was pretty much it. Um, and in those years, I think it, you know, it definitely helped me a lot because I, I didn't have any voice in my head saying like, Oh, you can't do this. Or what if people don't like, I was like, I could truly care less about anything or anybody back then. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and that drove me into trying a lot of different things. Certainly your career has, has speaks volumes to that. And I'm going to jump ahead to, to one of them that, that absolutely stands out. And that when you were working at uh, the, the music studio, so I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Yeah. On that. But that, that seems like uh, one, an amazing opportunity. You started off as an intern there. And then I appreciate at the time you, it was coming to the end of New York being the hub of, of uh, certainly music studios, but just, Expand on that because that that seems like a really interesting yeah interesting point in your journey. Yeah, so when I was younger, there were only two things that interested me when I thought about the future, and that was business and music, and especially hip hop. Like I don't know why, just something about that um, the sound. I, I still can't get it, you know, out of my system. So those oh, two I'm things, you, I, when I think you said that you like New York boom bap hip hop. And I, I, I agree with that. <laughs> I did. I did. And it started in Poland. Um, I, I I remember watching a movie called The Dis- Disorderlies. Um, and the Fat Boys were in that movie, which, you know, was like a older school, like 80s hip hop group, you know. And, and I heard it and just I paused. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was like, what, what, what is that? And then, you know, after that, like I found more and more and more and kind of, you know, but I know that's where it started from that movie. Um, So when I was in my late teens, um, I had the business going, right? I was selling weed. I had the record store, but at the same time I was a DJ, you know, as a record store owner with some friends where I was a DJ. So at 16, you know, best life ever, right? Like I'm DJing at raves, at clubs, at bars. I can't even get up to drink, but people are giving me drinks because I'm the DJ. Like I'm just, you know, it, was, it was great. <laughs> yeah. So I remember being at a house party in Chicago um, in the backyard and I overheard someone talking about a school to become an engineer, a music engineer. And I was like, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I, <laughs> I know this is a great impulsive, you know, by a candy. No, I love it. That, that's, that's great. So I shut down the store. I was out. I had like job offers. I was like, I don't want this. And I moved to Florida, which is where the school was. <laughs> like it was within months. And, you know, I was like, okay, I'm in this school. Um, and I thought the whole point to, to like, you know, the Mecca, the, you know, the, the, the unicorn field where once I get to things will be okay. It's New York, right? Because that's where the, right. you know, hip hop is, everything. I was like, you know, that's where I want to be. Um, so I was thinking, how do I get from here to, to New York, right? And, I'm, you know, I was watching for my opportunity. And a teacher came, a substitute, um, around mid, uh, I said, like midway through um, the entire school. 
And he was from New York, from a music studio, just left. You know, he got tired of it. He moved his family down, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, this is the one. He has connections in New York, right? So his name was Michael Wolf. Um, still remember the guy. Awesome guy, by the way. But he quickly realized how um, relentless I can be. And I wouldn't leave the man alone until he <laughs> finally, you know, messaged his friends in New York and said, yes, if you move to New York, you probably thought I'm just, you know, joking around. Like, well, you know, people say things all the time. He yeah. said, if you move to New York, you have an interview with my friends. And I already told them, but I was like, cool. As soon as the school finished two weeks later, I'm in New York looking for a spot. A month later, I'm at the studio. And, you know, the, the music industry was kind of ending, right? So I always had this um, strategy that I used and everything was just called the third door, right? And I can explain it to the listeners. Okay. Um, I'll use an analogy of a music club, right? So when you go to a music club, um, you usually have people waiting in line, right? These are the people who hope that someone thinks they're cool enough, good looking enough or whatever to get in, right? That's the one group. I'm not a part of that group. I don't, I don't care what anyone thinks. I'm getting in a different way. There's a second line, which is the VIP line. People have connections, money, know the owners. They come right in. Boom. No problem. I never had that. There's always a window left unopened somewhere in the attic or in the back. You know, it might take a while to get in. You might have to get a ladder. People can't see you. You sneak in. You change. You're in the club. Always the way I do things. It's the third door theory right they don't let you in through the front through the back coming through the window so when i got to the music industry you know I'm, I'm meeting people i'm seeing the industry is dying but the neighborhood i was in was a polish neighborhood right and hip-hop was also pretty strong and i'm thinking look like i'm not gonna fight all these guys for scraps in manhattan but i can dominate the neighborhood <laughs> I can dominate it. So within a couple of months, I found everyone that I needed to find that did hip hop. I quickly, with all my skills and, you know, with the studio time, you know, became the guy to go to if you want to record things. Boom. Put out an album. Before the album was even out, a documentary crew from Poland came to, to our neighborhood and to New York to film a documentary on hip hop people, you know, in, in the States, whatever, like the Polish hip hop. Right. So right. I was in the, all the major Polish networks being shown before I even got the album done. And, you know, like I said, I dominated the neighborhood, like the, the radio stations we had, I think we had two or three radio stations. I had like top one or two, um, uh, radio rated tracks, like for years, for years. At one time I had four or five songs in the top 10. Right. It was just that. Nice. I mean, yeah, dominated. So we put out two albums. Um, and then once I actually got offers from Polish labels saying like, oh, you know, we, we, we can sign you. I was like, mm, I'm like 24, 25 now. This doesn't interest me anymore because I yeah. see the contract, you know, like I was in business long enough. I'm like, oh, this is, doesn't sound fun at all. I'll make like thirty thousand dollars a year. I got to do tours all the time. Got to put yeah. out an album in a year. I can make that like just in a crappy corporation in New York. Right. So, but, but the main reason why I did go through it is because I'm one of these people who will not get to 60 years old and then look back on my life and look at things I haven't done. Right. I don't want to be that person ever. So this is why I kind of, you know, hit those things when I could, and I still do sometimes. Um, but around that time in the, in the music industry, um, I kept on thinking, you know, like, this is all great. You know, I'm, I'm getting pats on the back. I'm, you know, my little mini famous in the neighborhood and whatever, <laughs> you know, which I never really cared about. It was more about the music and just the, the accomplishments. Um, but I thought it's time to get back in business. I, I need to get back into, you know, making actual money. So the only thing that you really need in business and know how to sell. Once you, if you know how to sell, money takes care of most of the other problems. So I'm like, okay, I was always a pretty good salesperson. But I don't know why I can sell, right? So I just didn't have that knowledge. So I came up with a new plan. And this was to go to different corporations, get hired as a sales guy, go through the training, 
go through a month or two in sales, try to hit my goals and leave and get the next training and next training and next training. So I use them um, over and over. Like usually they use you, you know, they just take yeah. you at the number and spit you out. No, that's I very use, smart. I like that. Yeah, yeah. So I did the opposite. And I thought it was a win-win, but they didn't think so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, after seven or eight of those, like I'm, I was like, I'm good. Like I can sell. And that's when like the rest of the journey started. You started up, I think you called it your your kind of first internet venture, the Libelty SEO company. And so this was building websites and helping people with search engine optimization. Yeah, so things never go that smooth, right? No. Um, there was an impulsive buy before that. So when I got sick of when I was sick of all the corporation um, and and working for them, I was like, I don't need this anymore. Um, yeah, I'm very impulsive when I want something. Um, I just can't wait. I'm, I'm getting better now, but I, you know, I was horrible at it. So I just... <laughs> I think we all were in our 20s. Yeah, or yeah, so I took some of the money I had and I bought a coffee shop. Um, the size of Starbucks and I don't drink coffee. So you can imagine how great that was. <laughs> uh, but I did. I did. I was like, I got a business now. You know, and it took me maybe three months to figure out I hate this business. I really hate it. Overhead, unemployment insurance, dealing with all this stuff, you know, ugh, food spoilage. I mean, it was just like, I was like, this is nonsense. Like, you should go back to selling <laughs> weed, you know. But I was like, all right. So I sold the store. And then, you know, again, looking on the internet, you know, you find all your best ideas from forums on the internet. And I seen someone talking about SEO, right? Like, ah, oh, you can make money by ranking people in Google. Back then, it was really like the wild wild west like you could you know yeah the number one spot would change every single day it was just like up to whoever's like you know gaming them better so i was like i can do this i think you know so so that my first <laughs> my first plan of action was like uh, i'm gonna sell some of these and then figure it out and i did i went to the restaurant that i usually go to i went to my mechanic and i was like ah, oh, you want to be number one in google he's like what's that for and i'm like oh here look if I put you here, everybody comes to you. He's like, yeah, I want that. And <laughs> I, got, <laughs> I got money from all of them. And I started learning. And I did get them to number ones because, like I said, back then, you know, like especially locally, I was like, you don't need to do much. I just putting up a website, few keywords and some spammy links and you're in. So yeah. all of them were super happy and the company started growing. You know, that was my first venture <laughs> to the internet. And it's interesting. I think that kind of attitude that, in in those couple of stories you've just given us, uh, I mean, it shows an amazing tenacity, I think, and perseverance. And I, uh, your words that you said it was you were watching for an opportunity when you were hassling that guy in Florida. I think that kind of go get a drive is something that I think it 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 seems to be. Would you say that your parents contributed to that, or was that just? Did you feel that that was innate, or was it a combination of everything? Uh, no, my parents were horrible business people. They sh they should have never <laughs> even been in there. I mean, and it's just it's sad. Like it took me a long time to unlearn everything they taught me, um, as as well as the business teachers that I had in school. So there was a book I read when I was I think around thirteen, fourteen. I don't know why I, I had like a year where I just went into biographies, right? I just just kind of looking at okay. them, and it was a Warren Buffett book. And the only thing I took away from that book is like most of your life, say no to everything and wait. Right. Just okay. wait. And then you pounce on whenever something happens. And I've just used that method a lot. And that was, you know, the thing in Florida. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to wait, not do anything that I don't want to and just wait. And the second opportunity came, I was like, I pounced. I think he felt like I pounced on him too, man. Cause he even told me like, dude, like, <laughs> I, you know, like I, I'm not trying to be mean, man, but I was like, I just wanted to get you, get rid of you. And I was like, yeah, whatever works. And I think that that is a, a good lesson for some young entrepreneurs. Not that necessarily you wanted to literally badger uh, anyone to, to get you what you want. But I do think that a lot of people give up too soon or they shift their focus onto something else because their first or second or third rejection certainly puts them off. And certainly it's something that you have to learn as a salesperson or when you're learning how to sell if you if you literally are going to take that first no as okay, well I'm going to hang up or I'm going to walk away now, you're not going to sell anything, and I think that certainly is embodied in some of those stories of yours that 
you, you certainly the drive and to you know not take that first pushback as a rejection, but just a, a way of you know doubling, tripling down, or working out a different angle. You said that third way. I like that. I, that's that's a great analogy. So, one of the main things I learned in sales during those jobs was actually not how to sell, and it was just how to take rejection. Right? Yeah, I, I had jobs. Um, in different companies, which meant I did inside sales, outside sales, and retail, right? Oh, oh, everything, you know, under the moon. Outside sales were the most fun. And I'm saying that sarcastically. This was, <laughs> this was selling door-to-door in Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx, um, and all the neighborhoods where people are just extremely nice to you, right? <laughs> so, as, so as soon as you, you know, go in, like I would get doors slammed in my face, you know, even the post office guy would feel bad for me. He's like, dude, man, like I'm going to give you some advice, you know, and uh, you got to stop looking like a sales guy. At least you can get in that way. I was like, cool. So I, you know, stopped, you know, wearing whatever they told me to. And at least I got it through the door. And then like, I'm like, oh man, are you a sales guy? Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, that was like going to the pitch. But the, the main thing is um, like my, my, skin you know grew super thick and i didn't even realize it until you know i started connecting with people later on in business and they're like you know i see how they're taking you know rejection like oh i sent this to 900 people and you know something or even 50 or one person i asked for an interview they just blew me off and i'm like i don't even feel that anymore at all you know if someone like just tells me no or tells me to go away i'm just like cool next right like uh, there's nothing there's zero feeling in there um, yeah. but I think that really came from the sales thing. And, you know, people say like, usually you should have a crappy job when you're younger. Like, you know, you should be in fast food or whatever. I maybe, but I think a sales job, a crappy sales job outside sales, especially they'll cure all of those problems that, you know, you have about, you know, questioning yourself and rejection. I could not agree any, any, any more strongly. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, yes. Having a crappy job serving you know, fast food is okay and it will put a couple of bits of pocket money. But some of those things that you learn from those early rejections in some of those sales jobs, wow, that sets you up for later on in life, certainly when you're when you're looking to start your own business or even if you do want to stay in the corporatocracy to essentially, yeah, harden you for pushing forward on on some of the things that you want in life. Yeah, because the, the the difference is, look, if you if you've got a crappy customer service job, because that's what people usually want to you know tell you you should be having before, you know, crappy customer service job. Like, dude, those people don't really reject you, right? Like, all they yeah. do is show you how miserable people can be, you know, when they have <laughs> you know like a stress in their lives. That's all you're seeing, right? But when you have a business, customer service is one of the things you quickly outsource because it's just not it doesn't bring you money. There's there's no point for you doing it. So it's not a skill you actually need very much. Sales is when you actually try to persuade people to do something. And usually that's opening up their wallet and them saying no. And you keep doing whatever you got to do to make it happen. And that's the skill you need in business. Yeah. Yeah. With a, without a doubt. If, if you can't sell, I don't think you've, you really have a business. Uh, I agree with your quote. I think you said, if you can't sell, <laughs> you're not in business. Yeah, that's pretty much, you know, the, the first thing I, I knew. Um, you, look, money solves all the problems that money can solve, <laughs> which is a lot, you know. <laughs> it's like my friend said, his grandpa said, like, look, if you have money, you can be miserable, but at least you're comfortable and miserable. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, and, and just... Taking that point a little further, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of times where I would say that your journey is is interesting in that there were certain stressful points in your life, and instead of buckling down or letting those situations overwhelm you, it almost seems like it fueled you, Tom. And yeah, so- I just want you to talk on talk about that and and. And I'm, I'm talking about the early years now, you know, up to yeah, your first internet venture. I mean, how, how were you dealing with the stress and anxiety or any of these things that you might have dealt with? So this went on even after that. Like, look, don't don't get me, you know, wrong. Like, you know, things are fine and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm doing well. 
but I've had, you know, some horrible experiences along the way, you know, the, the ups and downs, man, like they don't, they didn't miss me. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah, I didn't, I didn't get that, you know, the lucky cards. Um, so, you know, sometimes things happen, man. Like I had a business where we were, you know, like even with the SEO, right. We had that business, it was growing. And then we invested, you know, thousands of dollars into it. We had, you know, a lot of employees and then Google changed a couple of rules and we were pretty much done in a lot of ways, right? Like everything, you know, starting from scratch. This happened over with our publishing business on Amazon. It happened before, you know, when I was younger. Like you're, right. you're going to get hit hard by life, super hard. I usually say like if you haven't been divorced and lost at least two businesses, like you're not a man yet. Like we can't really talk, <laughs> right? Because it's it's just a different, you know. Um, you just behave differently after that. But with me, like, yeah, there's been times where I thought, like, you know, I'm uh, this is this is done. Like I'm burnt out. I'm you know. But what I do is I retreat and wait, and eventually the anger and energy builds up where I'm, you know, pretty much ready to explode. And that's when I go after it again. Right. So I, I, I understand how I work and I'll do that. I'll be like, okay, you know, fine. This is not my moment. I'm going to, you know, give these two months or three months, whatever, like I'm going to, you know, hide out and I'm going to just wait until that, you know, that ticking time bomb, I start feeling that again. And that's when I go after it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's never been, you know, like completely equal, like, you know, where, where every day is the same and, you know, things don't happen. Like I've had some horrible things happen, lost a quarter million dollar business overnight. You know, you, you, this is when you go and stare at the wall for a week. Yeah. And, and that was the Amazon business you were talking about. Yeah. So the Amazon business. Yeah. So what happened is we were publishing a ton of books and we had a lot of employees and one day Amazon just shut down the account. Right. And, you know, there's nothing you can do with Amazon. Like I've spoken with friends who had the same thing, you know, hundreds, thousands of dollars, you know, when they're either product business or anything, and they just got shut down and, you know, there's no customer service to talk to about. So, but I mean, just things like that happen, right? And you just need to understand like how you're going to deal with it. With the Amazon business, this was not my first rodeo. So it only took me like two or three weeks of being just annoyed and angry and I put all that into the next business. And I think I was making more than I did with the Amazon business within two months. But I mean, I had the skills already, right? I had the skills, the experience. I had the team. You know, I cut some of the team, but I still had my team. So it was a different, you know, scenario. Like it, it happens in a much worse way when you're younger, right? Like when things like that would happen when I was 20 and I didn't have the skills yet, the experience, the connections, the money to go, get me through, it was much tougher, man. Like it was just like really like, oh, man. And how did you deal with it then, well, back in your it, 20s? It was the same thing, you know, just just go back, regroup, and then, you know, eventually I got tired of waiting, and I would pounce on, on whatever happened next. And, you know, and it's just like, it's it's really about energy management, right? Like, you, you kind of need to understand yourself right. and then know, like, okay, this is the time again to, you know, like, it's enough. It's enough, like enough of thinking, enough of creating strategies, enough of all this, like it's time for action now. And that's when I, you know, would go after it again and again and again. And again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, again, I think that's a great lesson for a lot of certainly, I mean, my audience is broad, but for certainly for young entrepreneurs to understand, you know, you take some time away, you essentially retreat from the world, recharge, get frustrated, get angry, fill that that uh, that meter, that recharge, recharge those batteries, and then that new recharged, reinvigorated person back into the world. And not always, because I, I hear a lot of entrepreneurs that they, they plan to the nth degree. So they keep planning and planning and planning. And then, you know, eventually they think, well, I might be able to do this someday but they never actually go ahead and do anything. Yeah, so what do you think about that, Tom? You know, it's hard. It's hard to, you know, tell someone to um, to do things if they're, they're not ready or they don't have the confidence. You know, it's, it's one of those where, like, not everyone's meant to be a, to be a business person, right? Not everyone's meant to yeah. um, to, to start something. And, and, you know, some people like just following and going home at five and clocking out and not thinking about anything. Um, 
but until you start, like you don't know what's going to happen. Like all the assumptions and business plans, it's like Mike Tyson said, right? Like you go in the ring, you can have all the plans in the world. You get hit in the face and everything yeah. is, you know, you just, that's when the game really starts. And that's the same thing with business. You know, you got to launch. Yes. And then, you know, after that, based on the feedback that you get and, you know, if you're making money or not, you'll quickly know if you're going in the right direction. But, you know, launching is key. Um like I even think about, you know, the concepts now when you hear like, oh, you should validate everything before you start, you know, but how? <laughs> how do you validate? Yeah. If you don't start, you're not validating because even if you have a pre-launch page, right, or you're like giving people like uh, uh, the special or sign up and, you know, coming soon, like it's it's a very different response that you're going to get when you're actually trying to sell it, right? Like people will give you an email much easier than they're actually, you know, buying people that say like, Oh, I love this free service will often never turn into paid customers. People yeah, who exactly. buy a discount that's special when you're starting out are maybe people who like discounts, you know, and it doesn't do anything when it comes to translating to your actual business or offer. So it's really hard. Like you, you, you do have to launch and, you know, there's a book that a friend of mine wrote. It's the seven day startup. Which, you know, it's, it's it's definitely hard to kind of really recommend it because, you know, like with any books, like there are things which, you know, happen behind the scenes. That's good idea. But the idea is right. The idea is fine. Like, you know, launch quickly, you know, like, like don't overthink things and, you know, just try to put it out and see whether you make any money or sales, or whatever. But, but the, you know, long business strategies and all the, the business plans, like, you know, keep that for school. That's what, you know, people want you to do in college. That's that's when it's really <laughs> valuable, you know, to get a grade. It might work when you try to get a loan from a bank, but even they don't care that much. If you have enough money in the bank and you want to get a loan, you don't need any business plan. They'll be like, cool. You know, it's like, it's always when you need it the most is where you got to come up with all this nonsense. Yes. Yeah. Now that's, that's, that's good advice for people who are starting out and, and just keep delaying or putting it off and coming up with all these what I call kind of nonsense scenarios in their heads about what their supposed customers may or may not do or what the market may or may not be ready for. Well, you'll never know unless you do an A-B test, unless you actually put it out there and see if there's any data to back up those thoughts in your head. So here's the, my rule of thumb. You know, if I meet you, right, and you tell me your business idea, and I'm like, cool. You seem excited, yeah. Anything stopping you from this? Not really. Uh, and I see you next month again, and we're having the same conversation. Like I'll probably not to not talk to you again. <laughs> yeah, because they 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 weren't serious with that idea. They it, it was a nice idea in their head. It was an academic exercise. I, I kind of think of that as a character issue, right? It's like like these are dreamers. Right? Yeah, you know, like you always know these people, right? Like. Even back, look look back at the people you knew in high school, right? Like the ones that always, you know, told you like all the stuff they're going to get done. And, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm moments away from being rich, you know, like just one idea away. Like, you know, like those people, right? Like yeah, that never accomplish anything. That's a, that's a character flaw. And I, you know, very quickly get rid of people like that. Like I understand that, like, you know, you're, you're dealing with – um a business already, right? And then you want to come up with a service, but you know, there's something stopping you, not enough time, too many clients, but like there's something happening. Like I can see why you're cautious, but if you're just, you know, haven't started and there's real no reason for it other than just, you know, you're just a talker like that. That's, that's when I, you know, kind of look differently. I'm like, yeah, I don't know about this. Maybe, maybe it's not for you. Maybe get a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tune out. I mean, so that leads me on to, so how quickly would you say, you know, which, business idea is good you know how, how do you kind of work through your way through that quagmire so with me i kind of um think of you know what do i have experience in what needs do i see in the market i'm not really big on surveys because once again you know people give you opinions that aren't really you know worth much but i might i might do a small survey um just to see if I'm kind of leaning in the right direction, maybe, but I'm not going to take them seriously. Surveys to me are more about compliance, right? It's like when, I don't know if you've been taught this, but I, I had people teaching me this. Like when you first meet a girl 
you tell her to, you know, put her hand on yours and then like you move it a little bit and see if she's going to comply with you, right? Just to see what kind of uh, tension there is, right? So this is the same compliance I kind of use with my email list and stuff. I'll ask them for something, not to really get their feedback, but to just see like, if I ask you, will you do it? Right. Just right. to see if okay. we're kind of, you know, have the right, you know, kind of chemistry here and, you know, then I can come up with an offer. Um, but more, I look at constraints um, when it comes to any offer or business. Right. So I think about what do I want my life to look like and to make sure that this isn't the easy way out. So if you look at online courses, for example, right, there are two different ways of doing it. One, you create the online course, you put it on your own page and you start selling it, which is the harder way, but one you control completely. Or right. you take the easy way out and you'll go on a platform like Udemy or um, Fiverr, Learn Pro, or any of these platforms, which then control your customers, control the experience, control everything, but do the selling for you, right? So you have zero control and then, you know, they can shut your business down at any moment. So... I always take the non-easy way out now because I took the easy way out a lot before and they always crashed. Your Amazon business was, was a perfect example. You know, you 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 built a business and then you know, something that's completely out of your control was just ripped away from you. Yeah, so so that's one of the constraints I always put on an idea or, you know, like, um, and then you got to kind of think about yourself, right? Like, will I have to spend a lot of time on the phone? If you don't like it, then, you know, if you do, that's not the right business. Um, do I need a big team? Do I need, you know, so you kind of do it based on your life. Because if you don't, you might come up with an idea that sells really well. And after a while, you create a business you don't like. And, you know, I, I see a lot of people go through this. You know, eventually you're burnt out and I'm like, man, this is horrible. But it made money, right? So for me, it's a lot about lifestyle too. And making sure this doesn't conflict with my personality. And I think when it comes to lifestyle, I mean, when people hear about you know the, the countries that you've visited, obviously the place even now where you're where you're based doing business, I think people get afraid or worried about how to even begin to broach having a lifestyle like that. I mean, how, how, do, how do I get staff? How does my virtual assistant know what I need to do? Do you want to unpick a few of those things? I mean, obviously not. we don't need a, an entire business plan on this, but just a, a starter's guide of if they don't know anything about how you would even go about being kind of free of that constraint, that corporate constraint, or being free to move around and do what you want to do. Well, it's like asking someone how to walk, right? Like one foot in front of the next. You know, that, that's that's really the same thing with business. Like you don't tackle all of it at once. You, you know, tackle it piece by piece. You know, like if you're starting a business, you're in a corporate world. Well, the first thing you need to do is launch something. So you actually start making some money, right? By yourself. Yeah. Don't move countries, you know, just, just do it by yourself. And then eventually, you know, when you have some money coming in, the first thing you should do, you should hire someone to take the fulfillment or something, you know, off your plate. So you can do more of what is actually bringing the money. You know, eventually, if you have enough, you quit the job. Or if you're like me, you quit the job and go straight in. But, you know, wh whichever way, it doesn't matter. But, you know, you, you start that way. Um, you know, like before I moved countries, right, because I was in the U.S. when I built the business, yeah. I moved cities before I moved countries. I wanted to see if, you know, I can still um, not break the business completely by just going to a different place. So it wasn't from me now going to unknown internet issues or, you know, switching time zones. It was really like, okay, the one thing we'll need to stop doing, and this is now a constraint in my business, which I always have, I am not selling anyone face-to-face -face anymore because that means I got to go meet them wherever they are and, and that's just not the business I want anymore. Right. So initially, that was the only thing I changed, you know, like we're going all, away from face to face and let's see if the business survives. It did. And once it did that, I was like, OK, well, what if I switch time zones? And instead of telling people like, yeah, you can call me whenever between nine to five now, don't call me. We're going to go email <laughs> only or 
you got to fill out a schedule. And, you know, for some people like, oh, you're going to lose a ton of business. Great. Because that's, you know, it's going to make my whole life better. So I'm, I'm cool. So it was a step-by-step process and it always is. It's not like I'm, you know, closing a, you know, like a job or something. And, you know, I'm starting a business, moving, switching time zones, got a team, getting funding. Like you, you don't do it that way. You know, it's just like walking. You got to just go, you know, one foot at a time. You don't, you know, skip a mile. Um, and I'm glad to hear that from you, Tom, because yeah. obviously you're, do, you're doing it and living that life at the moment. But I do hear a lot of uh, certainly young entrepreneurs that, again, are still either either in the planning stage or they've started a few things, but they've got another 10 steps that they wish to drop in the next month. And it's like, well, that doesn't seem uh, either sensible, reasonable, or it's not just not how you can build a business. And I think even that first step where you say you move cities – and see if it worked. And then obviously you can scale up from that. I think that is something that people should focus in, in, in that you, you can have that business and that lifestyle you want. But again, what you're doing is you're testing it against data and that data will inform you whether you're going in the right direction or, or the other. Or you can have that academic argument in your head and never have any clue on whether it's going to work. Yeah, like the the one thing I would stress is think in systems and not in goals, right? So anything that we do in our business here is we try to create systems, right? And these systems need to be sustainable, which, you know, it's it's a little different when you're like 18, 20, you know, you, you do sprints a lot more. Yeah. But for us, it's like, well, if I can't do this forever, um, do we really need want to start it? Right. Like, I I don't really want anything. um, For example, social media marketing. Right. A lot of people say, like, oh, just be super active on social media and you'll get customers. Well, I'm like, yeah, but that's that's not sustainable. That's not a system. You're creating a hustle, a full time job, which doesn't you know, that doesn't interest me whatsoever. And that's very interesting. Yeah. And half the time you're posting nonsense. Right. So instead of that. What if you could figure out where a group of people are hanging out that you're after. You might have to pay for the traffic, whatever. It doesn't matter. Figure out where they are and be very strategic about how you pull them into your business. And, you know, if it's a piece of content, fine. Then just whatever you're comfortable. Is it once a week? Is it, you know, once every two weeks? Now, the less you do it, the better you need to be, right? That's copywriting, storytelling, whatever. Got to be better because if you're not in front of people much, you got to make sure that that piece of content draws them in. Yeah, exactly. So the more active you see people do, the less skilled they are, usually. Let's take a small break, and we'll be back soon with the final part of our interview with Brad Hart. Good listeners, today is a great day to start your own podcast. So whether you're looking for a new marketing channel, have a message you want to share with the world, or just think it'll be fun to have your own talk show. Podcasting is an easy, inexpensive, and fun way to expand your reach online. So Buzzsprout is hands down the easiest and best way to promote, launch, and track your podcast. I mean, hey, look, I did it. So Buzzsprout gets your show listed in every major podcast platform. You'll get a great-looking podcast, website, audio players, and you can drop into other websites with detailed analytics to see how many people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and more. I mean, podcasting isn't that hard when you have the right partners, and the team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. And don't forget, following this link in the show notes lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you. So thank you very much. And that gets you a $20 Amazon gift card. So if you sign up for a pay plan, and that helps support our show and keeps us putting out great content. So join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout and get your message out into the world. Back now to our fascinating interview with Tom Leibelt. Yeah, and and I think that I hear a lot with regards to these internet marketers that you quite rightly said, they, they keep pushing this social media angle, thinking that that is the golden goose that will, will get them to some sort of magical goal in the future. I absolutely agree. I think it is. It, it's a daily grind and hustle. You basically... Yeah, you you may have lost your corporate job, but you've created a new job for yourself. 
And it could be much worse. <laughs> it could be a much worse <laughs> yeah. job. That's one of the things I've, I've been telling my team too, you know, like f- with podcasting, for example, like one of the things we do, um, and we use it as leverage, right? It's podcasting. One, I become clearer and clearer about my ideas. Two, we do a little bit of outreach. Three, we usually get an SEO link back to our website. And four, we have a method for getting on podcasts, right? Which one of my assistants does. And, you know, it's something that's natural to me. I can do week in, week out, every single week, right? So we pick, you know, a medium and we we stick with that. And then we create different systems that we use in the same way. But none of it is sporadic and like, you know, like I'm going to do it when I feel like it. It's a system that, you know, compounds a lot. And that's kind of what we like to build, uh, it's sort of like that saying, I think Naval, um, which he's a very famous thinker on Twitter, you know, I don't know what, whatever that means, but he said, <laughs> um, play long-term games with long-term people. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, and that's kind of the strategy and the philosophy behind our business now, you know, how can we make sure that we do it long-term with people who are doing it long-term and then. It's going to compound and and it does. Everything gets easier after you put in a lot of work. Yes, and that, that's the that's the missing element for a lot of people that are looking for those immediate gains now, now, now. It's those medium and long term goals sort of get shuffled to the the back back of their minds because they are always chasing those short term goals, which again great in your 20s but yeah not so smart when you when you get f- further down the line in your 30s and 40s to be keep keeping on kind of chasing or, or going for the next hustle yeah so let me expand on that a little bit because i've definitely also thought about this um gary v and the hustle mentality it is amazing in your 20s you know but it, it's much less cute when you're 30 40 and, and here's why yeah. <laughs> there's a bus analogy that i like to use for this Anytime you're starting a new business, imagine yourself getting on a bus, right? And each obstacle, I'm talking about major obstacle or skill that you learn, think of it as a bus stop, right? Mm -hmm. And you get past the first bus stop, second one, third one. And what usually we do, because that's when it gets hard, is we look out the window and we see a different bus. And everyone looks happier on this bus and the bus looks richer and it's just, you know, things like, you look amazing, you know, like people are just so hot. I'm only getting on that bus, you know. But you're getting on the bus and starting from step one again. And then you move to the next stop, second, third, and you move to the next bus. You keep jumping buses, right? So often when you see some business guy in his 40s or 50s, you know, I'm going to skip the ones who've been stuck on the same seat for 10, 20 years because there's a ton of those. Yeah. But often when you when you meet someone, you know, they're like, oh, I got 30 years of experience. And I was like, if I look back, you have 10 times three year experience. You're no better than the guy who got on the bus when he's 22 and now he's 25. No different. You just did it over and over, over again and never went past it. So you got to stay on the bus, man. You really got to stay on the bus. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I like that. That it is. It is that grasshopper, that that bus jumping, that greener greener fields. That those kind of analogies absolutely ring true. Certainly with me in business, when you you meet some of the people that have a million ideas a minute, and every six months you find them doing something different. It just shows a, a, a mindset or, or a a not. A lack of seriousness sometimes for some of the ideas that they're coming up with. Whereas if they just paused, maybe took them some of the, out of the loop and, and just thought about it for a little while, and then as you as you did, recharge your batteries and then jump back in. Yeah, and, and but the thing is, you know, like we we always make fun of those you know serial entrepreneurs, right, and those jumpers. But yeah. it's just as bad as the first person I mentioned, who you know, and this is so sad, right? Like you know, you you see someone after twenty years and you're like. You're still on that same stop. Yeah, we've, we've all met those the, the people that are still sitting in that same seat. Yeah, and it's it's just as sad, man. Like you just like oh, and there's nothing else to say after that because I mean, after 20 years, if you haven't been able to move to the next one, it's like yeah, I don't, I don't think anything I can say is going to help you. <laughs> exactly. That resistance, that muse, that hitting that entrepreneurial wall, that emotional roller coaster of 
running a business. I think that is something that a lot of people would be interested to hear you unpick and, and kind of discuss on what it is actually like to run one of these businesses. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. You know, like don't let anyone tell you differently. Like it's, you're going to have great moments. Yeah. You know, even like, you know, maybe years, but overall it's hard because it's a, it's a long distance thing. It's not a sprint, you know, and when you put a lot of time in the equation, like a lot of things will happen during that time. Could be personal, could be business, could be industry changes, like things will happen. You know, even your emotional state will go up and down. I mean, like now with the coronavirus, I know the the certainty has been taken out of a lot of people's lives and that, you know, that causes chronic stress and, you know, other different problems. So these things will happen unexpected. I guess knowing your why, you know, helps get through a lot of that, you know. Yeah, that's Simon Sinek kind of, yeah, know your why. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's it's also not easy for a lot of people, right? Like, if you ask me when I was 20, like, what my why is, I'll be like, not to be broke. <laughs> exactly. Right? And that's what it is for a lot of us for a long time. And it's fine. That's a perfectly good why for a long time. And eventually, you'll move into something else. Like, I got to make sure that my parents don't have to worry about things when they get older. And then kids or, you know, whatever. You, you switch your why. But initially... You don't need any crazy philosophical like, oh, that's not good enough. Yeah, well, it was good enough for me. Not being broke was good enough for me in the beginning for a long time. Because people always ask me that. You know, they're expecting like some some very insightful thing. And I'm like, no, that, that, that's, that's, that's the main thing. Don't be broke. If you came where I came from, you'd understand. Yeah. That certainly shaped you, that that early experience of having, not getting those gifts from the shop, you know, always having to struggle. So there, there's a there's an understanding that nothing is really given to you, but you can you can certainly work hard and and take what you what you need. Yeah. So another thing I do other than the energy management, because you gotta kind of watch that too, you know, make sure you don't burn yourself out. It's like, you know, when you go to the gym and you overdo it for a while, you might be out for three weeks. <laughs> yeah. So, you you know, that's energy management in business. Um, but the one thing I found after a long time is that things get easier, right? So when I was starting out, I remember, you know, some things happen, clients screaming, employees not doing their work, like all this just nonsense that happens every single day. But back then, this was all new to me, right? So I asked a friend that's been in business for a bit longer, and I seen him be miserable for a while. He came out on the other side a little better. <clears throat> and I say, dude, man, this is this is getting a little overwhelming. And he's like, wait one year. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, look, man, the stuff that you think is hard now, it'll be just another day. Wait one year. And he was <laughs> right. Yeah, he was right. The things that happen to me now, sometimes would have broke me back then and now it's just like i'll deal with it after lunch yeah you know because you just you just become better you become more jaded you become more resistant i would say to do yeah you 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 basically you have have certain life experiences and you certainly now have business acumen accumulated over years to understand that yeah, certain market forces, timing, whatever it might be, may change as a circumstance. And it's just about managing that at the time and not allowing it to overwhelm you and just freeze your thinking or getting you, or, or on the opposite, rushing headlong into trouble just because you think action equals, oh, it's going to you know, it's gonna solve a problem. It's that more mature wisdom. The one thing I also think of now and this is like the stoic thinking, right? Like when things are bad, I think, oh, it's, it's going to get better eventually. And when things are great, it's definitely going to get worse, right? <laughs> so I always think about the opposite of wherever I am, and it keeps me kind of balanced. Stoicism, I know it, it's certainly having it in trend at the moment, but I, I do think there's a lot, there's a lot to unpick. Read some Marcus Aurelius, read some of the Stoics and, and just understand that it, it, it's that resilience and not taking everything so personally or, or even you know understanding that things will change, 
but almost how you see it and how you deal with it is 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 going to determine the outcome. Yeah, I really like to you know pick like these little golden nuggets or elements from all the different things I look at, and that's one of the main stoic ones. Just you know, always think about the opposite of where you are. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a, that's a good philosophy. Talking about myths and. What are one of the myths or, or myths in your industry or profession that you kind of want to debunk? I mean, I think you have, you've debunked one of them, that, that it's hard work. It's not easy. So you have to put in the time. But what are some of the other myths that you think? Stop following experts. <laughs> like you, don't, you really don't need them. <laughs> you really don't need them. Like, you know, I can give you ideas and strategies, but, you know, the, the roadmap that I had, you can't follow it and get the same results. And you can't yeah. do it to anyone else's roadmap. So the main thing is like, I, you know, I'm, I'm really anti expert following and like, you know, gurus and all that stuff because I don't, I don't think it's productive. Yeah. This whole thing of gurus that there is one person that seems to have all the font of knowledge. I'm um, this omniscient kind of being, it, it is just nonsense. And if you've been in business for any length of time, you realize that, that that unravels pretty quickly also with books um almost any new book in business i kind of take it as fiction (laughs) um because most of them are written for people to do one of two things um for speakers it's to get speaking gigs they have to write a book every year to make sure they get speaking gigs or two is to get you to do something and anytime those two happen those are more fiction than reality. And it it actually came up in a conversation. Like my friend's like, Oh man, like I'm getting into fiction again. You know, what about you? I was like, yeah, I, I like fiction a lot. Favorite category business books from the last last three, four years, (laughs) you know, and, and it really is, you know, like the best stuff is usually, you know, older, you know, 20, 30, 40 year old, like the, the best books are usually, they stand the test of time. And then new things just rehash it and, Usually, they want to get you to do something. And, and yeah, yeah. It, so it's, it's sometimes a marketing vehicle for for them to yeah to buy yeah, but, something. But the the reason I'm, I'm actually mentioning both of these, you know, the experts and the books, is because most people think, and I think they're kind of told by the marketers, that the next book or you know expert or technique or something will finally bring success to their life or business. And there's no such thing. The yeah. next book will not change anything in the way you're doing it. You know, like you take action, get feedback, adjust, do it again. Like that is the only thing that matters. Now, when you pick up books, you know, it should be for a reason. Or when you look at experts, just look, look at ideas, right? You don't look at the expert, just the ideas coming out. And then see like, oh, this is a little different. Maybe I'll adjust my next strategy, my next reiteration based on that. But then again, feedback, did it work, did it not get the results and reiterate again, right? So the only insights you're looking for or things that you might, you know, uh, put into action at the next step, but there's no magical thing in any book that's going to all of a sudden change your life. It's just, that's just not how it works. And believe me, I read so many of these books and it never, ever happened. They might plant a seed or an idea in your head after really, really good books, but they won't change your business. Right. So often like, you know, you think you're being proactive or, you know, putting in an effort by reading something, but it's just procrastination again, you know? Uh, and, and, and that's the one thing I've noticed, you know, looking for information over and over and over again, instead of just doing something. Yeah. And I think, I think with, I mean, even as, as we've talked about a few of these people, it, it's almost like a magpie. You, you can dip in and out of a lot of these books. There will be, there is no one tomb that has all the answers. Certainly business and depending on your situation and your, your business, it will all be different. There's too many variables to, to count. So you, you can dip in and some of them will be relevant to you and some of them won't be, but it certainly won't be encapsulated in one book. That that's that is again a myth or a, a great marketing strategy for a publisher to push out, and you know certainly 
if I ever write a book, you're not going to get all the answers from from that. But there might be one or two things in that that certainly will resonate with some business owners and others will have absolutely no relevance at all because it doesn't meet their industry. It, it doesn't mean anything to their current situation in life or their current problems. So I agree. It, it's, it's about looking across the entire field and picking out the little bits that actually will work for you and and also again testing that because again some of the some of the advice just might be nonsense it might be most good marketing of it is. fluff most yeah, of it is. Good marketing and, fluff. and and this is why i I've, I've said this because i've read some of these you know so-called best marketing books and psychology books and we used their methods when i was starting out and they all fell completely flat it wasn't until we started figuring things out for ourselves we, you know we kind of got it working and then everything still comes down to it depends for clients and for each offer and service, right? Like, you know, the same thing will not work for every one of them. So this is why I'm, I'm just really, you know, against people, you know, trying to learn all this stuff, which then they're going to have to unlearn anyways. Yeah. I, I mean, that leads me on to what kind of leadership attributes are kind of most important to your company's kind of growth and, and as well as kind of your own personal growth. I mean, that leads, leads on to what you're doing as, as, you know, the head of your company. You know, most of it is just experience, right? You know, talking to people within my industry who are a bit ahead of me or in the industries I want to be in and they're ahead of me, you know, that helps me a lot. You know, some books do make sense, like uh, Ray Dalio's Principles, right? It's it's mm-hmm. definitely, yeah. you know, a, a very good book for just, you know, the way of you should be thinking. So we'll we'll go into things like that. But, you know, it, it's just the stuff that's supposedly timely and, you know, s- We'll, we'll grow your business like the easy way. That's always the stuff that we avoid. But there are, you know, obviously some books which do do help, which scares a lot of people. That that radical transparency. <laughs> it, it, I've I've certainly found that even culturally, there there are some parts of the world where that would scare the heck out of someone if they were to introduce radical transparency into their companies. Yeah. So often, you know, when you get recommendations from people. You know, like the main thing, like I usually ask now is like, do I really need to read this? Like, is this really super important? And most of the time they can say no. Right. Yeah. But there are some things that do kind of, you know, pass that. And and lately I remember when I read Shoe Dog, which is the biography of the guy who uh, founded Nike. Right. Okay. What that did for me, and I do recommend that book quite a bit, is that you know, as we talk about the like emotional roller coaster and the business roller coaster, you know, when I looked at the problems I had in business and then I compared them to the stuff he had by reading that book, I was like, man, I'm still not anywhere <laughs> near, you know, what I could be. <laughs> so stop complaining, get back to work. Right. Right. So, you know, you read books for different reasons. Like there's another book I recommend. Um, it's Total Recall, uh, which is the Arnold Schwarzenegger biography. And what I tell people to look in, in that book is the guy was incredibly smart. It, like most of us think he was just an actor, but he was incredibly smart. And look at the way he used systems in every single thing that he did, starting from bodybuilding, Starting his first business, real estate, politics, movies, everything he tells about the systems that he designed to become good at those things to to you know to create them. So you have to understand why you're reading something, what you're looking for. But that's that's the right. stuff. That's how we you know learn at this company too. Like uh, when we get recommendations, like that's what I'm looking for. You know, but someone's got to tell me a good reason why. And then we, you know, digest that. But we have some books which we reread a lot, like, you know, the the principles book. And there's a, there's a couple of different books we just reread a lot, like scientific advertising. Um, it's one of the books that some of the top, top advertisers in the world said you got to read at least seven times before you even start creating ads. Well, <laughs> so we did. Right. I, and it helped. So it did. It did help because, you know, like you read sort of, I mean, not everything, you know, is is probably as scientific as I said, but you learned some real principles that if you just read once, you're like, oh, yeah, maybe this is nonsense or maybe great. But if you work for a year and then read it again, 
it feels like you're reading a whole different book. And again, and again, and again, right? Like these things are different before you have different experiences. And some things you'll be like, man, this was brilliant. Now I understand it, right? So sometimes rereading the best books and, and we do this like helps a lot more than going after new stuff all the time. Yeah, and I think I think there is certainly a, a lot of great knowledge that has been distilled in some of it's not always chasing after the new. And, and I certainly know from even my, doing my research on you, what one of your key influences was Jeffrey Gittimer, his little red book of, of selling. And, and that that's certainly a, a good place to start, I would always say, if if you're looking to sell. Yeah, so here, here was the, the that thing, right? Like when I was first getting into sales, people told me, you know, like my bosses, like, oh, you got to follow this guy and this guy and that guy, which was usually like Brian Tracy or Zig Ziglar or, you know, one of those. Yeah. And, you know, I, I read the books and I'm like, man, that, that song and dance they're doing just to sell some crappy pot and pan <laughs> door to door, like that that doesn't seem like someone I want to deal with. You know, and then I started looking for people who seemed like they actually knew what they were doing. And the thing I liked about Jeffrey Gittimer, um is he used to teach sales managers how to sell, right? Which was interesting, you know, because not he wasn't going after the salespeople as much. But he taught more in principles than in, you know, like if you learn this song and dance and then all this stuff like you're going to know. So it was a little more timeless. And I kind of felt like, okay, this is important. Like you need trust for someone to buy from you. You need, you know, like he explained it in like very, like in a broad ways, but it, it made sense for me. And then it was incredible when I actually got to talk with him, you know, later on on my own show. Um, which I was like, man, like we went full circle, like from the day I started sales, my first real sales book to now you coming on my show. I was like, this is insane. You know, yeah. I was more excited about that than having any other big guests on my show before. It was, it was just something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it is like meeting your heroes, which sometimes can be great and sometimes, yeah, can be not so great, but obviously it sounds like it was a, a very positive experience. It was very different than meeting my heroes in the music industry. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. It, what, it, 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 ego difference or is it what was fundamentally uh, different? So think of yourself. Oh, without without uh, disparaging I'm anyone. Names. I'm not going to say yeah, names. Yeah. I'm just saying like <laughs> think of yourself when you're like 16, 17, right? You didn't know anything. Thought well, I knew everything. Th- that's that's one, one part of it. But, you know, they've done studies on this. And there's a reason why we like music. And we think that era from between when you were like 14 to 17 of music is the best because that's when you're really like a sponge and when you take things in very differently, like you're very open in those years, yeah. right? And this is why we kind of all like, oh, the, my music was the best, you know, in the 90s. Like everyone <laughs> thinks this, whenever, right? So you got to think hip hop is a very lyrical um, type of music. It's not, you know, it's much instrumental. It's very lyrical, right? So there's, there's stories, there's people giving messages and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I soaked a lot of this in, you know, 7, 16, 17, 18, you know, like all these messages and stuff. And then I met the people and I seen some of them were just a disaster, you know, either alcoholics or whatever, like just, just complete disasters. And I'm like, man, like these were my teachers when I was yeah. at that age. Right. And it, it really opened up my eyes. I was like, man, maybe sometimes you shouldn't meet your heroes. You really shouldn't. Thankfully, I didn't meet the number one hero that I had back then because he died. But I did meet some of them. And it was very underwhelming. I'll tell you that. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's those mythologies. It's that pedestal that we put them on. Certainly when we're yeah, as you mentioned that at that age, it's they're 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 like a colossus. Yeah, because, you know, that that's like the person that you not only are you listening to in your car all the time, but you might have a poster, you know, up on the wall. Like, it, it's just, like you don't do that now. You know, when you're 40, you don't put a poster of like, you know, someone on the wall. Like, it just doesn't happen anymore. You're different. Like, yeah. But back then, you know, when you think back, like to all the stuff that you soaked in. Yeah. You meet those heroes. It's it's often not not, not amazing. I mean, in the last day or two, I heard that Van Halen passed away. So that there's a, there's another hero to to well, certainly our generation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's that's the worst thing, right? Well, like when your legends start passing away, like the one that I you know said died before I met him. It was just he was shot, 
you know, so was something. But when they actually naturally start passing, then you're like, man, like I'm getting old. <laughs> that's, when, that's when you get that weird feeling like, man, like I was like 16, he was 20 something. Now he's passed. I'm like, man. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I, I always say that I haven't, I haven't reached that age. I don't think yet where I'm always going back in my days, but I, I do, I do absolutely now understand that right now I value my time more than I ever did. You know, back at, uh, as always, you know, when you're young and running around, time was, was not even a concept. It was, it was always in the forever and, and never, never. We were going to live forever. Now, even with business meetings and time that I spend on projects, it, it always is distilled down to, am, well, am I having fun? Am I getting out of something out of it? Is, is it serving some sort of purpose? Uh, and if it doesn't meet one of those few criteria that I have, then I, I'm just not not interested in doing it anymore. Yeah, so one of the ways that I um, tend to think about it is you need to put value on your time first, right? Whatever that is, yeah. like, you know, two or $300 per hour or less or more, whatever it is. Yeah. And then you stop doing nonsense, right? Like I will fall <laughs> asleep at a crappy movie easily because I'm like, this is not worth my time. I'd rather get sleep, you know, whatever. If I start reading a book and it's not good, I'm like already wasted $20 here, five pages. I'm out. <laughs> I am out. So it becomes easier to, you know, make the right choices, but you got to put value on your time. So if someone says like, oh, you know, I have an online course that I want you to take, blah, blah, blah. It's only $400. The first question is like, how long is this thing? And then, you yeah. know, they'll say like 10 hours. I'm like, okay, so that's $3,000 plus your 400. That's 3,400. Is that even worth it? Right. So th this is how you should start thinking, you know, as you get older, you know, because time is super valuable. And I think that's, that's also a valuable thing. Obviously why they come to, you know, your companies, we market online courses. Cause I think sometimes some of these entrepreneurs, they have an idea, they may have an expertise, but I, I'm, I'm sure, and again, I don't want to put words into your mouth, I'm sure after five minutes of listening to their ideas, like, yeah, you may have the expertise, but I mean, is, is, is there anyone going to buy it? You're boring me to death. So given the fact that our attention is divided through so many distractions, why would I sit down and pay for nine courses uh, of an hour long listening to you drone on, even if it's the most mind-blowing bit of information? I think some people don't understand that now you almost need to mix that kind of entertainment with competence and expertise in, in delivering some of those courses. Yeah, with me, it's really easy. Like I'll listen to an idea and then you'll know very quickly what I think because you'll either get like, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. Or do you want to know the truth? <laughs> and that's, you know, yeah. that's really the only two ways that the conversation goes. Um, but yeah, like even even with, with our business, you know, I, I still much more enjoy working with people who launched by themselves and they've already got some things right, but they got beaten up a lot too. And then it's much easier for me to kind of pick it up from there. Right. It's, it's less yeah, so okay. with someone who's got ideas, dreams and things that they're just going to hit it out the park. Like I want you to go try doing that. And then when you, you know, you come back battered after like the third inning, <laughs> then I'm like, okay, now we can talk. It's just much easier. But it's always this launch, you know, first, you know, even before I, I, I like to um, take a client on. I think that's sensible. Dip your toe in the water, give it a go. And then if you, if you then see that well, you can even identify all the gaps in your knowledge base or in you now understand that you don't know <laughs> the, the unknown unknown. What would you say that the start of this coronavirus, at the start of 2020, you know, the, the world was looking a little bit different. What's, what's kind of vastly different now than and, and on your list of, you know, to-dos and, and, and goals or, or systems that you want to create? Now here we are in October of 2020 as opposed to at the beginning when, when we first got locked down. So, like, for me, it's not much different. You know, like, we... We've already been a remote company. We've uh, got lucky in the industry that's just blown up during this thing. Like, like for for me personally, it's it's not you know or business wise, there's not much difference. Like, we're still taking the same path. You know, we're dealing with some clients. We are um, creating different income streams, um, and and that's just you know the natural path in the business. Like, eventually, you know, like you 
first you you know you get clients because it's the easiest thing to do and then you know once you get really really good right, this is important because you want to get that then you build something that can sell multiple times and you start focusing on that then you maybe think of a startup that you can sell so we're just following the natural path like nothing much changed for us what i did notice is that you know my employees um need a bit extra care right now, you know, because everyone's dealing with chronic stress overall, you know, there's mm-hmm. a lot of uncertainties. And and that's that's more of like my focus now is just to make sure that everything kind of gets through it, you know, fairly okay mentally. Um, and how, how, are you, how are you dealing with that? How are you dealing with your employees' stress? I just, I, I, you know, I had talks with them, you know, because they, you know, everything's uncertain. I was like, look, like we're fine. You know, if you got to take a little time off, you're fine. Like our, your job is fine. You know, we still got to get things done. Um, it'd be good if we worked a little harder because we don't know what's coming up next. Right. Next year could be mm-hmm. a much bigger recession than this year. Um, because for now, like a lot of countries are still giving stimulus when that, you know, eventually people have to pay for that. Um, yeah. So I said, look, there's, you know, there's some things which we have to be watching out for. But, you know, overall, we were fine. We have a, you know, um, a, a chest, I would kind of like to call it in the back, you know, which can take us for even 15 or 16 months easy if we have no income, which never happened before. So, you know, we're doing just fine. So I, it's more of just explaining things to them, you know, why we're doing things more than before. Um, what I think, how things are looking, how the health of the business is, why people react the way they are right now. Like, you know, if someone's sending um, messages out, like maybe one of my employees and they're getting much nastier responses. I'm like, well, this is, you know, the stress that I've been talking about, you know, people yeah. lashing out. So it's, it's more of just, you know, being more of a leader and like, you know, when things are going good, it's like, well, money's coming in, everything's good. Don't worry about it. Just do your job. Where now it's more of, you know, like, let me explain what's happening, you know, when they're having a hard time. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a healthy and, and, and a really mature and, and, and great way to, to deal with that. I think a lot of the uncertainty, well, I mean, obviously we are living uncertain times, but having, uh, and having your, your boss or your leader or your team manager or line manager just kind of explain or even explain their unknowns, you know, what they don't know. But as long as they can see that you're empathizing and, understanding the situation that will relieve some of that pressure and i think that's you know that's that's a great way of handling it there yeah that's that's what i found you know what people need they just need a little more understanding at this moment and you know every country's dealing with it differently you know the the a lot of people can't go see their families you know the flights are off you're not going to go on a good vacation some people are still locked down some are not like it's just it's a mix right which is which is the problem like we don't have one worldwide strategy everyone's kind of every country county sometimes is dealing with (laughs) it differently so that's where a lot of this stress comes out because people lost control over like the basic things in their lives and you know you definitely don't want to start your marketing off like that you know like hope this finds you well in these hard or you know like i'm like right away like stop man stop (laughs) 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 and try again like this is horrible horrible so i make sure i tell my team too. don't don't come off with these you know like this this weird kind of like these weird platitudes that they throw out there yeah, hoping but that. it's it's like so bad especially on linkedin man like everyone's starting like you know hope these hard times treated you well would you like help for this problem which i'm gonna you know help you with now like everyone is like starting off with it and then going straight into a pitch it seems like i think actually sales pitches became worse overall which is already you know was pretty bad before (laughs) but often now i'll get like a message and someone will say that things are hard and then expect me to try to figure out what they want from me you know like that's 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 a good way of putting it yeah it's really really bad i'm like just get to the point i'm like look you know say hi tell me what your offer is why it's good for me and then leave me alone that's what you want to do right now (laughs) But I'm just finding that, you know, people are not taking this well um, in a lot of ways. And in salespeople, it's just sad, you know, like the ones that just are not very good to begin with. But you're seeing them now under all this stress and you're just like, man, like you're falling apart. Yeah. Uh, and I think there there was one thing I heard that you were talking 
which I, I I totally agree with you. You were you said yeah, and I think in another podcast or maybe it was a, a blog article that selling is that transfer of emotion and value. It is, and I couldn't I couldn't agree more. That, it is, that, and and in the beginning, before you start transferring emotion, right? You need to figure out where that person is at, and you kind of meet them in the middle, right? So you kind of you know you you join that conversation going on in their head. So for example, if someone is stressed out right now, that means they're maybe arguing with their spouse. Maybe sex drive is not as strong as before. Maybe they don't find things pleasurable enough. Maybe they don't know what's going to happen with their career. Like there's different conversation happening in their heads, right? Depending on on the stress, right? And you kind of need to meet them there, right? kind of hook them in like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is exactly what I'm thinking. You know, not selling them. You just meet them. You kind of get them, Mm -hmm. get into that conversation. You make them feel okay with you. This is where kind of like the warm-up sequences or, you know, having, you know, giving some insights or just anything. You know, yeah, I've gone through this too when, you know, I kind of solved it, you know, wasn't easy, blah, blah, blah. You kind of get them through. And then, only then, when they kind of already are talking with you, and sort of on the same page is when you start transferring that emotion and getting them to onto why your solution is the best one where most people are skipping that whole step. Yeah. I mean that, that's <laughs> that for my audience is, is some absolute just pucker advice. It's just amazing that that's exactly what it is. I, I see people launch into, uh, as you said, they give throwaway lines about, I hope you're well. And then they, they dive st- straight into their offering w- without even matching yeah, and, and the thing, hope you're well. That's not joining a conversation, man. That's <laughs> no. not that's not how you get me interested. I'm not thinking in my head if I'm well or not, ever. Like not in that way, <laughs> right? I mean, are you selling like a uh, antidepressant? <laughs> what, what, <laughs> what, are we, what are we doing? So, and I, I ask people that stuff like that too. I'm like, what are you selling? Does, you, you're not, this doesn't match at all. Like your opener didn't. Like I tell them, they remind me of these guys that you not not as much anymore, but they would harass you like at 3 a.m. in New York. Like when I was coming back from the music studio, I'm like, Hey man, you know, like, where are you from? I'm like, Oh, Oh yeah. I've been there. Hey, you want to buy this jacket? (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) 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 Like where you're from uh, matches to why you should have this jacket. (laughs) The the only transition is, yeah, I've been there before. You want to buy the jacket? And I'm like, okay, so this is already where, yeah, we're on the same page now. And yeah, so it's the (laughs) same type of thing. Right. And, and it's a little harder now because people are going through things. So you have to really connect with them a little more, you know, because people are, you know, always a little more wary and a little more, I guess, unapproachable when things like this happen. So you just have to make that beginning part a little longer, stretch it out, maybe give them more time. Don't push so hard, but you're still using the same technique, right? You still need to use all those steps and transfer the emotion. And if you're wired and scared too, like, what do you think that's going to happen when you're trying to sell someone? Exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, the, the, these are absolute choice, choice nuggets that, that you're throwing out here that, Tom, that I think because you've done that work and you know throughout your career, which is is a fascinating one, and and in that period also where you did that work of gaining as much training and learning as possible, I see I see a lot of inexperienced salespeople or marketers or people who have to essentially convince someone else to buy their you know product service or widget or whatever it might be, and they are they literally are like second-hand car salesman or those phone for you kind of salespeople. And I'm not disparaging them specifically. We all started at crappy sales jobs and worked our way up. But when you get to a different level or when you start to treat sales as a science, you'll start to understand that there are better ways of one, first connecting with the person you want to sell to and then identifying a need and then obviously going into a pitch there as opposed to (laughs) <laughs> where are you from here's a jacket <laughs> yeah it's it's you know it's, that's a really bad script but you know maybe it, it works maybe obviously in, in in the best of times otherwise he would never use it right he must have sold or knew someone that sold a jacket using that beautiful script so he's just using yeah. it over again 
But, you know, the yeah. second the times get a little harder, that's when you start seeing the difference in results, you know, between who's using a bad script or, you know, or, or actually knows how to create the whole sales conversation from A to B, right? So th- that's the problem, right? I think it was a, it was Warren Buffett, too, that said, you know, like everyone's doing well when the, you know, when, when the water is high and then when the tide goes out you see who's actually naked underneath right so it's the same thing when a situation like hap- like now happens uh, you start really quickly seeing like who was faking it before yeah yeah very true so how is how is i mean i, I understand that your business spans over well at least three continents asia and chiang mai I understand you have an office in Warsaw and and then one one in uh, I think in New York. How how are you dealing with? I guess you can't get on a plane these days to to, to go to all of these different places. But how are you dealing with with coordinating all your businesses like that? Um, it's actually not a big problem. So these offices are only for me, mm-hmm. right? So when I fly to the U.S., I have a place to work immediately. When I go to Warsaw, same thing. So it's really me. Like I have one in Chiang Mai too. My workers are all remote. So, like I said, we've already been, you know, doing the new COVID normal before COVID happened. So yeah. when this started, like, we're like, okay, do we change anything? No. <laughs> like, there's, we, the internet's still on. We're fine. Um, yeah. I think, I think a lot of these online businesses and certainly things that you were thinking about setting up these processes and these systems beforehand – I mean, right now, since the world tipped on its head, are uh, proving that these are, are some of the systems that we will then have to start adopting. Yeah, bigger companies or people, traditional legacy businesses that have, have you know, very conservative, that have always done 15 meetings in a day, you know, face-to-face meetings. It doesn't work like that anymore. And you've certainly got to jump on that. That's well, for sure. you know, things just become easier, right? Like when you... When you think back to like uh, maybe even 15 years ago, right? Trying to build a website, it was a hassle, yeah. you know, <laughs> hand coding and servers and stuff. Now if someone comes in, boom, WordPress or like card.com and even no coding required, you have a website up. So, you know, yeah, I, I had a, you know, maybe jump start on it a bit, but it, it was you know, because of the way I wanted to run my life. But look, like for the listeners, like it's going to become easier. Believe yeah. me, two, three years of companies having to do this, they're going to come up with new and much better and easier ways of getting everything done online than even they are now, right? Like right now, you you know, Zoom is one of the most popular meeting tools. They'll change. They'll be a new thing and a better thing. You know, we might start doing VR, you know, and camera yeah. calls. Like who knows? Like it, it's going to become much, much easier. And then you'll sort of feel like, yeah, of course, this is a normal thing. Everyone's used to it. You know, it's like anything, like it's new. So for, you know, some businesses, it's difficult because they were dealing with other problems, you know. And like I said, don't tackle everything at once. Well, they had to sort of tackle two things at once without wanting to. Like, how do we make our workers go remote and use all these tools while still tackling the same problem that we had to before? And that's kind of where the frustration came out of. Eventually, you know, it's just going to become a more of a, you know, do we work in person or remotely? And, you know, like everyone's going to know how to do either of those. And, and a couple of questions that I, I usually get asked, and I think you're actually better qualified to answer this than I am, is how, how is it best to coordinate with your re- remote team? Or how are you coordinating with your remote team? Or how did you even get your remote team is is there a website remote teams.com or a lot of people who are now understanding that their business does need to radically shift don't even have the first step on knowing one where to find that staff who who to find and how to how to then coordinate between i don't know depending on if you've got 5 10 50 remote staff or whatever it might be how do you do it tom that's actually a very Hard problem to tackle quickly. Um, yeah, and, and, and you don't have to tackle it quickly or yeah. tackle it any way you want, my friend. So definitely, you know, there are websites um, for this. You know, like I, I think maybe Remote Jobs actually is a website. Um, online, oh, oh. <laughs> onlinejobs.ph uh, was one of the older ones by Filipinos. Um, there's um, some 
which match you with the right person. Um, there's there's a lot of websites. Like just one Google search, you know, where do I find remote workers? You'll get a bunch of them. That's okay. not a difficult thing. What I found more difficult for people is not knowing why they're hiring remote workers to begin with. Like okay. if, like if you have a company and you already have the workers and they went remote, I mean, that's easy, right? Because the only difference mm-hmm. now is like we just need to figure out how to do what we haven't done online. But for most people, they'll hire someone and don't know what to give them. And, you know, those people are not getting training. They're clueless. They're waiting for the boss. The boss is waiting for the employee. And then, you know, there's uh, disagreements and everyone's upset. Like the, the, the way we always um, work around this is I will create systems and throw someone in to see if they can run that system, whether it's marketing, customer service, whatever, just a system that I've designed so that I don't have to do it anymore. So something that's already proven to work or making money or that's just taking too much of my time, create a system around it or an SOP, which is a standard operating procedure, mm-hmm. um, but they, which they can just follow like a McDonald's worker and just throw them in. Like, this is a job that you got to do, do it all the time. Tell me how the results were. Let's look at the feedback. Tell me if there's a better way of doing it. Like just let them tackle something that's already defined, right? Like you don't want to throw a new remote worker into an undefined thing. Like, Hey, you know, I need help with marketing, figure it out. Usually a horrible yeah. idea. <laughs> um, so, so that's the best advice I can give on that is, is define exactly the tasks and then throw someone in and then they can go through them, improve them, give feedback or get better, come up with new ideas. Uh, but it should be something that's already making money constantly right and, and and would you say that do they need to invest in a whole bunch of new software or can they use the same tools as the telephone and email or do they need to like we don't use many tools you know google drive which is free you know email yeah. skype like all these stuff you know it's, it's free you just you can use it so, don't worry about the tools that's you know the tools are not what's standing between you and making money very mm-hmm. rarely do i find that yeah, it's more about just you know having you know uh, just understanding your business, right? Like if if you are having you know a lot of customers and you know you need to talk with them stuff, then you probably need to figure out the main questions that they're asking, write up the common answers, and hire someone to start taking that over as a customer service rep. You know, if you're getting a lot of leads inquiries, maybe you need someone to you know, kind of get qualified them before you talk to them. Like you, you need to look at your business, you know, and see which parts of it. Like if, if you're doing fulfillment and you're building websites, well, it's probably not a good idea for you to be doing sales and building the websites. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, you figure out sort of the common theme between the websites that you're building, you know, and write those steps out, hire someone else. You can maybe then come in, and just help them with like the problems that they're having. But you know, the things that you're doing all the time, write them out, have systems and then outsource that. That's, that's all it really is. Yeah. I, and then again, great advice. I think m- make sure those systems are in place. Otherwise if, if, yeah, if, if your employees are not sure or if they're unsure about the next steps and because there is no system in place, you're, you're literally trying to, push push a, a rock uphill you know your your business is, is already starting on rocky ground uh, at, at that point so tom what, what's kind of next for you over the you know, the next kind of quarter and the next year and that what 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 are you looking at are you looking at new projects or you're continuing on with doing what you're you're great at your your, your marketing online courses so the you know the marketing is is just stable right like um and, and we've been playing around with putting different offers out you know with that same concept which is now you know, build something we can sell multiple times, you know, and I've done it before at different businesses in this niche. It's no different. You know, I've been dealing with clients long enough where we can, you know, start putting these out. So we're testing those out, um, you know, trying to drop our client interaction to maybe 20 or 25% at the most, just because, you know, I want to work on something now that's more scalable again. Yeah. Um, personally just, you know, waiting for all this nonsense to kind of stop so we can start traveling. I can see the family in Europe and the U S again. 
I was going to say, yeah. How, how's that affected your family life? Are, are, are they all in? Are they still in Europe, or are they back in the US? Some are in the US, some in Europe, and I usually go see them like once every year or so. Like I'll go to the US once, and then to Europe and US. Like so, this year we skipped that, uh, which is fine. Like I'm, I'm completely comfortable. I've been uh, trading my time here between the mountains and the beach. Um, so which oh. is which is oh. okay. <laughs> Color me jealous there, Tom. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's been completely fine. Um, but you know that's the one thing because you know your parents and family do get older, so I want to spend time with them as well. Um, yeah, of course. Business wise, next year, you know, we are we are working on things, but it's the, I I told my team we are not um doing any high risk uh, scenarios for for a while, just because we don't know how the economy is going to look. Mm -hmm. so it's more of you know just like building things and and saying no as much as we can and waiting for an opportunity to to pounce on something that's that's again that moment that we're in um and like i said the client thing is just stable so we're, we're you know we're fine it sounds good it sounds good well tom i think you've been very generous with your time so thank you very much and thanks thanks for joining us at the opine motel uh, so how how can people find you? Where can where can they go? Social media links or anything else that you want to uh, throw out there? The, the best place is go to smartbrandmarketing.com. That's where we, you know, like hold all our content and we anytime we change services or do anything else, it'll always be under that brand. Um, so that's the best way you can contact me. Super easy to get a hold of. I don't have any gatekeepers on that end. <laughs> <laughs> you might ask you <laughs> you uh, might after a while my friend well like i i have um someone that goes in my email and they uh delete all the nonsense and just star the stuff so if they see something personalized that's like hey tom blah blah, blah like they'll leave it for me but if yeah. it's just complete nonsense i don't even see it well that's good yeah right? so it's that yeah. type of thing but there's it's not a gatekeeper they just make sure like is this person actually reasonable and should they be talking to, <laughs> to <me? laughs> Yeah. Are they worth your time? Which is the most valuable resource at the moment. Yeah, pretty much. Nice one, Tom. Well, thanks for that, my friend. And yeah, good luck with the, with the rest of 2020. And it sounds like it, it's going well for you at the moment. And 2021 can only, can only get better. Yeah, it'll, it'll be just fine, man. Like, and if it doesn't, I'll make it. We'll adapt. I'll make it. But yeah, yeah like I'll, I'll, I'll force my way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent. Thanks for that, Tom. On the next episode of the Opine Motel podcast. So inspired by my Q&A session previously, I'm going to look at passive aggressiveness, what it is, how you can overcome it if you have it, or how can you deal with people who do come across as passive aggressive? So I look forward to your company then. I'll see you next time. Good listeners. In a announcement of self-indulgence, please, if you've found anything of value, please subscribe to my podcast on your favorite podcast listening service. You can also visit my website, www.opine.network. Oh, 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 and also check me out on YouTube and write a review if the need should take you. It really does help new listeners understand what the show's about. And also, hey, I'm a little partial to a bit of positive feedback too. If anything has affected you in a more serious way, I highly recommend my psychological professionals in your area to explore and delve into making you live your best life. Be well. See you next time. I look forward to your company then. Thank you very much for listening. I'm LJ, your host. This has been the Opine Motel podcast. Music credits go out to the intro. Fluffy by Smith and Mister. Interlude sounds by Sephiros. And to see us out, happy life by Prayer. Be well, everyone. See you soon.